Adoption is a wonderful thing, but what happens when one 4chan user adopts another 4chan user? The answer is worse than you might think. But first, thank you to today's sponsor for making this all possible. How do we feel about magic items? If you need an injection of the arcane in your campaign, this might interest you. 240 magic items spread over 11 themed decks, from weapons to wondrous items, cursed items to artifacts. This is the one-stop shop for any magic item you would ever need to engage and entertain your players. But there's a twist that makes this stand out. Imagine you're delving in the dungeon with the gang, and then boom, you uncover the magic item. The DM will now show you the art of whatever item you found, but it doesn't include the rules. You have to identify or attune to the item to figure out what it does and if it's cursed. This brings to the forefront the very thing that makes looting so cool. It's the mystery behind the magic item, rather than just getting a plus one longsword of bland power. So check out the Kickstarter, linked below. The DM literally keeps a player in his basement. First up, content warning for some sexual situations and textbook emotional abuse. Before you get discouraged by how damn bleak this thing is, there is a happy ending and someone gets punched in the face. So, I first started playing D&D all the way back in 4th edition with some friends from high school. After we graduated, we all went to the same college together and kept playing eventually switching from 4e to 5e. We saw each other every week, but we all had social lives outside of the game. It was pretty rare for us to hang out or talk outside our group text. After graduation, me and a couple of other players left the state for our jobs or higher degrees, but most of the group stayed in the area where we grew up. We thought moving out would be the end of our game, but this was at the time where playing online and things like Roll20 or Fantasy Grounds started to take off. We took a couple of months off, but we decided to continue our game on Fantasy Grounds, albeit with a new DM who hadn't been with our group at all. We are usually pretty chill about newcomers joining our group, and we weren't gonna complain if the Forever DM could finally play. I will be calling the new DM Hal, after the character in the movie Megamind, because... Well, you'll see. The group met Hal in our hometown soon after I left at some convention. He seemed like a pretty good guy and a great DM. I didn't know as much about his personal life for the first few months, mostly because I would only talk to him through Skype when we were playing and on the group text when we weren't. All I knew was that he lived with his parents and that he had a graveyard shift at some hotel nearby. Things started to go wrong when he introduced a new player to the group. He told us that this friend of his was interested in our game, and that every time he told her about it, she would get really excited and ask lots of questions. Again, we're always happy to introduce a new player to the hobby, so we invited her into all of our stuff. I'll call her Penny to borrow from a similar, less self-aware story. Penny was brand new to D&D, so we had to help her out with the rules, character creation, etc. She would always be asking little questions during the game, which we were all happy to clear up for her. But Hal seemed really annoyed at her, and sometimes he would snap at her with some really inappropriate insults. We would always immediately call him out and say stuff like, Whoa dude, you can't say stuff like that. And he would always walk it back and say he was kidding and chalk it up to his lack of filter. A little off-putting, but it barely happened and he always stopped after being called out. Now, we're a group of millennials in our early adulthood and or college, so jokes about being depressed or overwhelmed were common. We all knew how tough life could get, so we have a little support system going where if you can't make it to a session because of life stuff, or if you're just feeling too tired, it's really not that big of a deal to sit one out. Sometimes we would also take like 10 minutes before or after the game to just vent about work or school or whatever. If anyone needed to get something off of their chest, 
we thought this was a pretty neat system to make sure our friends could stay healthy and the game could keep being fun for everyone. Hal would come to abuse the crap out of it to emotionally manipulate every single one of us. About a year after she joined, Penny started to arrive late to a couple of sessions and even miss one or two. Again, this is normally fine. Life happens and we're just playing D&D. For some reason, this made Hal really upset. He would mope for the whole session and say things like, <laughs> What's the point of doing all this prep if my players won't show up? Even though it was literally just one player and we've had people miss before. And he would just generally say he was feeling really depressed. Penny got better at making it to the games on time, but Hal seemed to get worse and worse. He would drag the entire group down and make self-deprecating jokes so often that I'm almost sure he was fishing for someone to say, No, don't worry, we care about you. He even went so far as to joke about killing himself and saying things like, I'm seriously considering doing it tonight, or you guys have been such great friends, goodbye. This is a problem and I used to know several people who would do this. Specifically, people who would make negative comments about themselves or self-deprecating jokes. In my experience, people who joke like that are genuinely mentally unwell and the jokes are a thinly veiled cry for help. It always made me feel bad and concerned as their friend. And if you're actually trying to be humorous, the last thing you want your jokes to be are piteous and concerning. Self-deprecating jokes can be risky. When you do it, you need to actually be funny. Otherwise, people are probably going to assume that you're fishing for compliments. In our group text, we all assumed he was just actually clinically depressed. Which, who knows, he might be. So we were understanding and tried to help him out and talk to him when we could. That's when I realized what was really going on. Here's what actually happened, gathered from my long conversations with both Hal and Penny. So Hal and Penny met on a site called 4chan, first red flag I know, as a part of a thing called Adopt a Neat, where people who are considered neat or not in employment, education, or training, basically doing nothing, are paired up with providers who give them food, housing, and sometimes spending money, all out of the kindness of their hearts. Well, as you can probably guess, the providers often ask for something in return for all of that stuff. Anything from cleaning the house to, you guessed it, sex. So, Hal agreed to let Penny stay in his basement and buy groceries for her, and Penny agreed to be friends with benefits with Hal. Do you ever just read something that gets worse with each passing word? Like, there wasn't a moment in that word salad that made this even slightly bearable. What a terrible day to have eyes, especially considering that, if I recall correctly, it was said in the beginning that Hal lives at his parents' house. This whole thing is just so gross and cringe, I'm gonna move past that. I threw up in my mouth a little when I heard it for the first time, but as far as I can tell, both of them knew what they were doing at the time, and it is all consensual. In the end, I thought it was weird, but hey, these are consenting adults and they seem to be enjoying themselves. They had both been in our group for a couple of months when Penny apparently got in a serious relationship with another girl. As I understand it, they talked about it and Penny started paying rent, I assume at a heavy discount, and they became just friends and landlord-tenant. This is around the time that Hal became a little unstable in our game. Turns out the reason she would arrive late or miss sessions was because she was spending time with her partner. Hal would always ask for specific details every time she went out, and if she wasn't back by the time that she said, he would apparently send increasingly paranoid and sometimes suicidal texts to her. 
He told her that he was just protective about his friends and that his anxiety makes him paranoid. This, friends, is classic grade A manipulation. According to Penny, he would also hug her at random and ask to cuddle with her because he's touch starved, whatever that means. So for those playing at home, that does get us to creep bingo. After I learned about this stuff, I got extremely worried about the whole situation. Was this legal? Did they both tell me everything or is something worse actually happening? Would I be just as responsible if I stood by and let it happen? I convinced myself that if I replied every time he made some sad comment or called him immediately after he threatened suicide again, he would be talking to me and he would not have a chance to emotionally manipulate Penny or any of my other friends. After all, they didn't know what he was doing, and I did. If I could somehow get to him and make him see that what he's doing is wrong, I could get him to leave everyone alone and go back to how things used to be. I told my therapist the whole story because it was ruining D&D night. The one thing that let me relax and forget about work for five hours a week. She helped me realize two things. First, in trying to save everyone else, I had actually gotten myself stuck in his web feeding him with attention and affirmation. Second, and this one was hard to admit to myself, the reason I was able to recognize his patterns before anyone else was because I was seeing myself in him. The same feeling of superiority that made him take advantage of everyone was making me think it was my responsibility to save them. So I just let myself ignore him more and more, tried to think of more practical solutions, actually started hanging out with the rest of the group, Penny included, and for the first time in almost a year, I actually had fun with my childhood friends again. This is a good example of a therapist doing what a therapist should do, which is protecting their client's mind, even if they have to grind it into them via less than pleasant facts. Nobody likes to be told that they have something in common with someone they hate, and it's so easy to get caught up in everyone else's problems and lives that you begin to ignore your own, or worse, that you helping others directly causes problems for yourself, like here. But while it's nice to help others when you can, and you absolutely should, it's also not your job and should only be done when you can afford it. But Hal was still there, and the more fun we had, the harder he would try to bring us down. My friends and I knew what he was doing, but Penny refused to believe that he meant any harm. Anytime we suggested that he may just be trying to manipulate her, she said that she knew he wasn't because she knows him. It broke my heart a little, but I understand that breaking out of years of emotional abuse is not something that's going to happen in one or two conversations while playing Quiplash with a bunch of nerds. So they both kept playing with us. Eventually, he stopped bringing his problems to the table after he realized we weren't really buying it. We were lucky enough to have been given catharsis and a happy ending, so I would be remiss if I didn't share it for those invested enough to have read this far. Ever since we were in high school, we all had this dream of going on a big trip together and playing D&D somewhere exotic. Now that we were all adults and most of us were gainfully employed, we could actually afford to do that. So we planned a trip to Disney World with the whole gang. We pooled our resources and saved up for years, and the people that could afford it paid for the ones that couldn't, although Hal was very insistent on paying for Penny's share himself. Wonder why. I was in charge of the lodging, so I made sure to separate the guys and the girls so that there wouldn't be any trouble. Silly me, to think it would just be that simple. The trip was fun, but we had to spend most of our energy keeping him from actually harassing her. Every chance he got, he would try to touch her in some way or buy her something inappropriately expensive, so she either had to take it or look ungrateful, and just general whining when he didn't get his way. 
We asked him why he kept trying to touch her and he said that he was like that with all of his friends and that he's just a physical kind of guy. This all sounds very creepy but I had a complete blast for the entire trip. It was like I was a little kid and he was a serial starved anthropomorphic rabbit chasing a bowl of cereal that he could never actually get. First, of course, he didn't like the room assignments. He said dividing us by gender was sexist. So I asked if it would be okay if Penny switched with one of the guys. And of course he said yes. We planned to share beds, so I let him choose which one to sleep in. And when he did, I put my stuff down on it. He tried to protest, but there wasn't a way to say it without making it obvious that he just wanted to sleep with Penny. So he settled for just making a slightly homophobic comment about how we had Penny sleep with the gay guy. Okay, very homophobic. Anyways, he would try to sit next to her on rides and I would plop myself right in between them. I tried putting my arm around him on the jungle cruise and he smacked me away and said, Don't fucking touch me! I just looked at him and said, I thought you were like that with all your friends. I'm just trying to make sure you're not touch starved. <laughs> I've seen rodeo bulls look less angry than he did. When we did play D&D, my character was conspicuously targeted by every spell and attack possible. He said he was trying this thing where the DM rolls death saves and not the players to add suspense. Imagine my surprise when my character died after three rolls. That's how you know you've won. You've gotten so far under his skin that he was just waiting for this big moment. Imagine what kind of total fucking loser gets denied the opportunity to act like a total creepazoid and is just sitting there, clenched fists like, uh, you might have won this time, but in Dungeons and Dragons, I got you right where I want you. This is so perfectly petty, there should be awards for OP's level of pettiness. It's always hilarious, because the petty one can just keep being as passive-aggressive and underhanded as they want, but if the subject actually does or says anything, the petty person has an unlimited amount of plausible deniability to draw from to make the victim look even stupider. It's such an awful way to exist in the world, being honest, but when you do it to a bad person, it becomes hilarious. On the last day, he pulled me aside. He started yelling at me about how I was getting in his way, and he accused me of trying to get with Penny, like I was trying to take her away from him. I said that both Penny and I were in committed relationships already, and that he doesn't own her. He got louder and louder, spouting every incel nice guy talking point like a goddamn tape recorder. I'll admit, I got a little pissed at him. So I said the most hurtful thing that came to my mind. If you actually saw her as a person, you wouldn't have to lock her in your basement to get her to be with you. He punched me hard. I don't remember much after that, but I apparently fell and he started kicking me. I had a giant bruise all over the side of my face and my torso looked like a grapevine. But I had something much more precious than that. An actual crime. Camera footage. Witnesses. I watched this man get dragged off by people wearing Mickey Mouse name tags. Literally the best thing that's ever happened to me. Penny was absolutely pissed at him. And whatever concern she had for him turned into pity. She was luckily able to make her flight home and moved out as soon as she got there. Hal and I had to stay, sadly. I spent a day in the hospital and I had to make sure the police got an accurate report of what happened. The cleric and the sorcerer were more than happy to give a statement as witnesses too. We're starting the game again next week. I offered to DM a few one shots while we get the group back on track. Penny is living with her girlfriend now and I think they're planning to move out of state. And that kids is the story about how I fixed my D&D group by getting punched in the face. 
It's funny, for a guy so obsessed with hating chads and jocks, he did stuff I've only seen movie bullies try to pull. This has been a roller coaster of a story, and it's odd saying that this had a happy ending given that it ended with OP getting punched, but on the other hand, I would much rather just get punched than deal with the legal and social consequences of what Hal has just done. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this story. If you have one you would like to share, definitely post it to r slash or email it to me directly. Till next time.